Hi, my name is Dominic Mohilo. I'm here at the DevOpsCon 2019 in Berlin. With me is Damon Edwards, uh, C, uh, CEO co-founder, and yeah. co-founder yeah. of Rundeck. Um, so um, when we are talking about DevOps, the mm -hmm. ops uh, part is seldom in the focus. Um, Dev part and uh, the whole culture thing is um, more uh, of interest. Mm -hmm. um, why is that? Why is ops not in the focus? Well, I think a lot of people think that ops is in the focus, but I think they mistake deployment for operations. So the part that's not in the focus is what happens after deployment, right? We've gotten fixated on this idea of deploy, 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 right? The original was, you know, uh, Netflix, uh, um, Flickr, they deployed 10 times a day, right? That's crazy, it's incredible, right? How do we deploy 10 times a day? And I think, you know, when the original conversation started, it was about the relationship between development and operations. And the flashpoint, you know, where the, the where the things go wrong is at that time of deployment. That's where development and operations uh, connect. So a lot of focus was put on deployment. And I think since then, what's what's happened is a lot of the DevOps conversation has been about dev towards ops, right? How do we uh, how do we build, test, and deploy application code as quickly as possible? Um, but if you stand back and look at the end-to-end -end life cycle, that's just one piece of what has to go on. There's this whole other, well, what happens after deployment? All the other operations concerns that have to, uh, that have, that have to happen, um, you know, that tends not to get as discussed as greatly in the, uh, in, in the DevOps uh, conversation. Um, and there are many practices in the ops sector that are not very up-to-date. Um, can you emphasize on that a bit? Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, operations, like they're, the individual skills and practices are actually quite up to date, right? In terms of automation, in terms of uh, the platforms and, and the technologies. Um, there's a lot of great momentum um, sort of on the skill side. Um, but what's kind of out of sync with what's going on in the rest of the world is uh, the rest of the, of the IT you know, life cycle is uh, you know, the ideas like agile and flow and uh, fast feedback and working in small batches. Those ideas have been sinking into the development side of the house for almost 20 years now, right? Agile has been, you know, whether people were doing agile practices or not, the thinking's been there, the books have been there, it's been in the tools, the terminology, these ideas of, you know, fast feedback, flow, um, you know, working in small batch sizes, uh, these are all kind of, you know, functionally or, or kind of product aligning, you know, teams. Um, there's a long history of that, whereas on the ops side of the house, the ways of working are really kind of rooted in the classic kind of ITIL functional silos, command and control, um, you know, way of, uh, of working that's kind of been around since, you know, the 90s or early, you know, 2000s. So it's not just a matter of, oh, the individuals need to change their skills or they don't know how to do things. It's more about how we approach and structure the work of operations that needs to catch up with um, what's, what's going on on the dev side of the house. And there's good reasons why it's not just a one-to-one -one transfer. You know, there are other considerations that operations has that development doesn't have. Um, so it's not just a forceful, oh, well, dev's gonna take over ops. Um, it's a matter of giving operations a space so they can, uh, you know, kind of ingest a lot of these lean and agile ideas um, in their own way. And um, then we get that kind of true, you know, harmony between dev and ops. Mm -hmm. And um, other techniques, operational techniques that could revolution revolutionize the way how operations work. Um, you know, I'm not sure if it's a. I guess, I guess you would call it a, a a technique. It's more of like a design pattern, which is um, you know a, a problem in operations is with extreme uh, functional silos, right? So that it's like, oh, we have the Linux server team, the Windows server team, the storage team, the DBA team, the firewall team, the DNS team. I mean, everyone's in these kind of very functional things, but work needs to flow horizontally across those, uh, those different teams. So what happens is, because we have all these different specialists, special kind of know-how, or in some cases, there are access issues that, oh, well, this has customer data in this environment, so only this team, this small team, can access this environment, yet all this work needs to go on there. So what happens is we end up with these ticket queues and um, that drive all of these interruptions in waiting. You're either constantly being interrupted by somebody from a different functional group trying to get you to do something, or then when you have time to get back to your other work, you're constantly waiting in a ticket queue for somebody else to do, to do something for you. So a lot of that time gets, gets uh, um, you know, eaten up by the interruptions, the waiting, and all that coordination overhead that goes into that. And so, you know, one of the things that, that we've noticed that is, and actually Rundeck was almost kind of founded on this, 
the company was not the open source project. The company was founded on this idea, which is how do you replace all those interruptions in waiting with self-service, right? How do you take all the knowledge that is in that functional team's head, right? And help them turn it into standard operating procedures that they can then safely delegate to other people. So instead of having to be constantly interrupted for these uh, repetitive uh, things, they can hand off the self-service. Uh, likewise, those teams that need something from them instead of waiting, um, they have a self-service way to get that operations task done. So you know what that leads to is the ability to distribute operations uh, the ability to take operations actions to where it's needed best in the organization so you can make things, the workflow, uh, better uh, through the organization. Mm -hmm. Later, you'll have your talk uh, about SRE. Can you, yeah. um, for our audience, uh, explain what SRE exactly is and um, which role it plays in operations? Sure. I mean, SRE is effectively kind of, a, it, it's a rethinking of how operations work gets done or the, what the role of operations is. I mean, it was originally coined The term was coined at Google, um, but it's really, they were putting the name on something that's been going on in a lot of uh, kind of web scale companies. Um, and the fundamental kind of idea is, well, what if we applied sort of software discipline and software development thinking to how we run operations? So on the surface, people get excited about, oh, it's like you're basically taking the, the mindset and the skills of software engineers and you're you know, kind of injecting that into to, uh, operations. But it really has some fundamental different points of view that come from the point of view of these companies don't exist to write software; they exist to to write so to run software, right? So um, you know, in SRE, there's some key principles, um, you know, such as um, this idea that hey, we don't want to have our operations team constantly buried under what they call toil, right? Which is saying that well, they're you know they're constantly in this churning mode, doing a lot of doing a lot of repetitive work. Um, in, in this kind of SRE model, we should limit that amount of work, that repetitive, could be automated work, and we should instead uh, make sure they have at least 50% of their time available to do engineering work, to do things that will move, move the organization uh, you know, forward. Uh, they also talk a lot about shared responsibility. So saying that, well, in the classic world, um, you know, the uh, idea of an SLA was operations agreed to say, we're going to have some penalty on us if we don't, if we, the service falls below this level. Um, you look at the kind of the SLO, service level objective, uh, the, S the SRE kind of version of the same idea, it's about a shared responsibility model. It's that if we fall below that SLO, operations is our business, is what we do, we make our money running software. The development and uh, the business side and operations all have to basically stop what they're doing and swarm and try to figure out how to, how to raise that, S, uh, that SLO above. So fundamentally, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of modern uh, rethinking of what is operations work, what are the kind of people and skills we want to apply to that operations work, and then what are the different um, you know, kind of thought processes or uh, design patterns do we want to apply to, to, how, we, uh, to how we work. Um, serverless is on the rise, so to say, yeah, yeah. Um, and it will definitely change the, mm -hmm. the, the way how operations work. But um, what impact will it have exactly? I mean, I think you know, serverless is it's the same kind of impact as you know, containerization, virtualization in the cloud, right? It, it's a, it's it, it's another architectural design pattern um, that we can uh, that we can use. Um, there's some economic impacts as well, like oh, if everything's a function, we can easily track the cost of. Uh, the cost of things. So I think it's going to have some pretty kind of far-reaching implications. Um, but I think what it doesn't get rid of is the notion of operations, right? Um, if you talk to people who are currently kind of going down the full serverless path, one of the great examples is Patrick Dubois, who was the person that coined the term DevOps, found the first DevOps days. Really, the word DevOps is, uh, is around because of Patrick. Um, he uh, has a startup where it's um, um, it's all based, you know, serverless, Lambda, those types of uh, technologies, all in the cloud. And you read his Twitter feed; it's fascinating because it's all operations questions, it's an operations work. It's just in a different context. But if you look at fundamentally what he's talking about, it's understanding what's my system, what are the limits, you know, what are the weird behaviors that happen, how do my systems break, how do I respond to them if I break. Um, that whole investigatory uh, kind of first response plus first responder kind of mindset um, that comes with operations, it's all, he's doing all of that, except it's all in this serverless world. So, um, you know, the technology is changing. I think, as I talked about before, distributing who does what operational tasks, you know, kind of at, at what time, 
um, is being distributed and being, being rethought. But the fundamental domain and discipline of operations is just as relevant today and, you know, or tomorrow in the serverless world as it was in the you know, Java web app on VM world as it was in the classic you know, mainframe world. Right? This, this operations as, as a discipline is there, as a skill set it's there, it's just kind of being redistributed and the infrastructure and the tooling looks, looks, uh, looks different. And thanks, Damon. Well, thank you. And thanks for watching. <laughs> <laughs>